First, um, I've been a prosecutor for 31 years. But in the first 10 years, I did what we call real crime. Um, murder, rape, manslaughter, that sort of crime. But, but when I started doing the environmental prosecutions about 20 years ago, I'd been used to dealing with bank robbers. And all of a sudden, I'm dealing with people committing environmental crimes who are honorable, hardworking, dedicated individuals. Individuals and corporations and municipalities who had no desire to cause harm. These are good, honorable people. Why are they standing in my courtroom? And what we did in the last 20 years is for every case we've ever looked at, whether it's gone to court or not, we've done a root cause analysis to say what is the underlying cause? Why are these good people standing in the courtroom? And the causes, the underlying causes repeated themselves over and over and over again. But what I found most shocking and mo what made me angry, that virtually all of these offenses were preventable. And so that's when we started going to industry organizations and talking about what are the causes of these environmental incidents. If you understand the cause, then perhaps we can prevent the bad thing from happening. That's why I'm here in the hope of preventing some of these uh, things from happening to good folks. Now, I also do this lecture, of course, for industry. But industry, I have a huge advantage. When I appear in front of an industry organization, I don't have to say this, but they get it. I can charge you. Mr. Industry. So the audience is awake, alive. <laughs> They're interested. And I've said nothing. It's just everyone understands that there is a vulnerability and they are paying attention. The problem, however, my experience with municipalities is you don't have that same unstated threat. The audience, when you're dealing with a municipality, suffers under a number of myths and misconceptions. And I think those myths and misconceptions make the message hard to deliver. It makes the message hard for um, them to take it up. And so this is what I'm going to try to do this morning, is to talk about these myths and misconceptions. These are not mis and misconceptions that you folks sitting in the audience have. So if I can, hopefully, if we can expose these myths, um, perhaps, hopefully, perhaps you can use this as a tool, as a way of getting your message across when you need to raise water in the priority of your village, town, whatever. Okay. Let me talk. First of all, what I'd like to call myth number one. Myth number one is that the requirements that we have by the government, whether it's in regulations or approvals or codes of practice, this is just government red tape. This is just some requirement that some bureaucrat in Edmonton came up with. And that these are just wishes, advice, helpful hints. And if your audience thinks that when you're talking about the requirement for a qualified wastewater operator as just a nice to have, that is going to be lower on the list of priorities. The folks in municipal councils, they're not dumb. They're hardworking, dedicated, thoughtful. They're there because they want to improve the world. But when it's a question of priorities, what raises a thing in the list of priorities? If it's importance. And if you think that these requirements are nonsense, they get lower priority. So myth number one, let's dispel it. News flash, the requirements in the approval are prosecutable offenses. 
If you fail to comply with the terms and conditions in your approval, you can be prosecuted. Codes of practice. How many folks here understand that the requirements in a code of practice are also, if you fail to comply with them, a prosecutable offense? So this concept that the requirement for a qualified wastewater operator is just a nice to have thing. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It is a legal requirement. It's the law of the land, thou shalt comply. Let's say the second myth, and this is um, when I've been talking to the investigators who have done the investigations against municipalities, they tell me this is the the most pervasive myth that they run against when they're dealing with these municipalities. There seems to be a myth out there that council members and mayors and CEOs are immune from prosecution because of the protections that exist first in the Municipal Government Act and secondarily in the contracts that they have with the operators. Now, let's look at the Municipal Government Act because the investigators did ask me to, to emphasize this. They thought that if we could cure this one, this would go a long way to um, instilling uh, the appropriate level of respect for the requirements in the legislation. There's this lovely, lovely section um, in the Municipal Government Act, and it's got such a lovely heading. Protection of counselors and others. Fabulous. And I'm paraphrasing. Counselors, council committee members, municipal officers are not liable for loss or damage caused by anything done or omitted to be done in good faith in the performance of their duties. The problem with taking the Municipal Government Act and saying this can give me protection is that it reveals a complete misunderstanding that of where environmental prosecutions, environmental offenses lie. We have in Canada and in UK, there are two separate legal systems. There's the civil system with which most people are familiar, and the criminal system, which thankfully they're not that familiar with. Now the civil system is designed to deal with wrongs as between me and you. If I run into your car in the parking lot, and I'm sorry if I did, I will be forced to pay you, to compensate you for what I've done to you. But the payment of money makes us all even. You're okay, I'm okay, just between us. That is the civil system. But the criminal system is very different. The criminal system deals with if I came and I punched you, if I come down from the podium and punch you in the nose, it's not merely a wrong that I've done to you, although it is a wrong to you. That wrong makes everyone in this room afraid. You cannot live in a civilized society where people come down and punch people. So a criminal wrong is wrong not just against the victim, but against the whole community. And so the outcome or the interest of the criminal law is to punish me, not to make it up between you and me, but to punish me so that other folks won't do the same thing. So you have these two very separate kinds of legal systems, and there are totally different rules that apply. Now on the civil system, because we're only talking about money, it's the courts, the legislation says, it's okay for us to come up in advance with agreements so that if I run into you in the parking lot and you're a municipal employee, I'm going to get my money from town council. There's nothing wrong with that. Or there's nothing wrong in the Municipal Government Act to say in a civil situation, you have protection. In the magic words, loss or damage. 
those are civil concepts. They're not criminal. Newsflash, none of the protections in the Municipal Government Act will save you from criminal prosecution. Nor contractual terms. Contractual terms will say that I can shift the risk to another agency. When we were up in Grand Prairie, um, one of the private uh, companies came up to me and said, well, I think we've provided security for our municipality because we are the approval holder. No, 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 no. no. You can't contract your way out of a, a criminal liability. That has changed nothing. That sense of security you have is not worth the piece of paper that it's written on. Get over it. So um, if we can dispel when you're making your pitch to your municipal council, when they say, but we're immune, they're not. Myth number three. Now this is, in my experience, the most pervasive of all the myths. It's it's not restricted to municipalities. This is the uh, misunderstanding, misconception that is responsible for many prosecutions against big industry. So it's not, I'm not being particularly critical of municipalities. This is a widespread myth that's out there. And the myth is this. If I make a mistake, I'm the dumb employee. I turned the tap the wrong way. Who gets charged? The generally accepted in the community, well, you get charged. You're the one who made the mistake. And the employer, what can the employer do? The employer told me to be a good girl. The employer told me to stay out of trouble. What more could the employer do to protect himself or herself from my mistake. But this is the myth. That somehow or other that the employer is removed from the mistake that the employee made. And again, newsflash. There is a residual obligation on the employer to supervise that employee. There is a requirement that the employer create a system to ensure that mistakes are not made. Human error is inevitable. So the Supreme Court of Canada in that old famous case, Sault Ste. Marie, has said, thou shalt have a system in place to compensate for the inevitability of human error. So that if I, as the employee, make the error and turn the tap the wrong way, my boss and my boss's boss and the municipality who hired me are also on the hook if they fail to supervise me to make sure that there were systems in place to make sure that I didn't screw up. And yet we understand this um, in just the normal sense. If you hired a, um, an employee, you would never just at the point of hiring say, well, welcome aboard. Please do a good job. Goodbye. In normal discourse, in normal business, one expects that there would be a performance review. There would be some kind of auditing of the performance of the employee. Well, it's exactly the same when we're dealing with the performance of operators on a wastewater treatment plant. And that a municipality or an industry or an employer is directly responsible for the mistake made if they fail to have a system in place to prevent those mistakes from happening in the first place. To be fair, I've um, done a lot of trials in provincial court on the environment side. And many of the provincial court judges who are criminal judges struggle with some of the science involved. They, they find that quite difficult to wrestle with, and so do I. But the one thing they really get that's really easy is they understand this failure to supervise. And so it's pretty much a standard position in the law of Alberta right now. If you, have a fail if you do not have a system, whether it's an environmental management system or some kind of system in place to manage your employee, you're just guilty. End of story. Don't be chatting. So 
as you say, this, this myth that of personal responsibility on the person who turns the tap. If we have to undo that myth and put responsibility where it lies in law on the employer whose duty it is to supervise. And now, I, I'm going to take a little more time on this one just because I, this is, I think, such an important point. I've looked at some of the cases where I haven't prosecuted a municipality. And may, I think those lessons learned, I, I think, are very powerful. And I, I will be very careful. These are municipalities who weren't charged. They didn't do wrong. They did good. They did the right thing. So I'm going to be very non-specific because it would be wrong for me to, to give you information to identify who these, these folks are. But let me give you two examples. Um, both cases involve the falsification of records by the operator. You know, there's a requirement to do the testing, and one was in the case of a potable water plant, one was in the case of a, a wastewater plant. Both operators falsified the records. While some people might call that fudging, in my world we call that forgery. And forgery is punishable by a maximum of 14 years in jail. Now, these individuals were charged with the criminal code offenses, but their employers were not. In the case of the one municipality, the municipality, first of all, had an experienced qualified operator. That's almost like insurance. They had uh, a, an audit system. And to be fair, the falsification by this experienced operator was sophisticated enough that it might have fooled the auditor as well. So you, they had a system in place, but they had a sophisticated accused. So in that situation, was the, char was the town charged? Of course not. They had a system. They had a qualified operator. So they had met their liability, their duty, their job. Second municipality, same situation. You had an experienced, qualified operator. They also had a quarterly audit program. The only problem with their system of audit is they gave advanced warning to the operator. So the operator knew when the auditors were coming in, and he could fiddle with the books just in advance auditor coming. So again, this is a situation where neither municipality were charged. They, unlike some other folks, understood their duty to supervise. Um, myth number four. This one I have heard from um, witnesses, uh, municipal counselors standing in the witness box. So this is not a situation where you and I want to have this discussion. And the belief of some of these council members were, but I'm another branch of government. You can't charge me. I'm immune. I'm, I'm just, I'm a government. And this one surprises me because when you look at the number of municipalities who have been charged, so I don't understand where that myth comes from. And I also don't understand because as we keep talking about this the leading case in the area of environmental prosecutions or regulatory prosecutions, period, is Sault Ste. Marie. Everybody's heard of Sault Ste. Marie. You've heard the words due diligence bandied about. But people seem to forget it was the city of Sault Ste. Marie. It was a prosecution of the municipality of the city of Sault Ste. Marie, which was the starting point for this entire regulatory regime. So the thought that you can't go after a municipal council is just, I don't know where it comes from. I fear it's because if a municipality has been charged, they don't share that information with the other municipalities that perhaps they keep it in-house. Uh, that's my best guess, because I don't understand where that myth comes from. And I would say sort of the final myth is 
not that you can't charge another branch of government, that you wouldn't as a matter of public policy. And I get the argument. I, I get this argument. You, it would seem foolish t for the provincial government to charge a municipality, have the municipality found guilty, and pay a fine back to the provincial government. I mean, taking money from one group of taxpayers and putting it in the pockets of another. I mean, I get that. And so do the courts. So the way that we deal with that public interest argument, this is how the courts do it, is the municipality may be convicted, but rather than extracting a traditional fine from the municipality, the municipality is required to undertake an environmental project that would benefit not only the municipality, but the uh, whole society. A another way of doing this, and I've seen this more in the federal prosecutions, where the municipality is required to go to a public meeting and essentially uh, admit guilt, mea culpa, in front of its other council folks from around the province. So um, we deal with the public interest argument through the sentencing process. It is not a relevant consideration on who gets charged and whether they get convicted. That's, that's not what it's about. These are the myths that I think make your audience not responsive. I think if you can cut through the myth, the audience will be, what's that old thing in the movie theater? The audience is alive, the audience is listening. Remove the myths, perhaps the audience will be listening. So for you operators, again, these are arguments that you are going to have to make. Um, each situation will be unique. But if, I can, if you can use some of what I'm, I'm saying this morning, perhaps this is a sales pitch that would work for you as an operator. Operator says, I need a new pump. And this is a real life story. Council says, we need money for the Zamboni. Maybe your operator, as an operator, your pitch is, except you've now kind of violated that law thing. And oh, by the way, you might be personally responsible for violation of the law. Again, would your audience be more attuned to what you were saying? Maybe. As I say, your, these are arguments that you're going to have to make. But I hope that might be um, a, a thought, uh, an argument, a bit of ammunition. Now, what do you do if you're a council member and you've got, you're voting on an important issue? Can we, we need to make uh, an update to the potable water plant. We need to have it brought up to the standard so that we can be sure, we can guarantee the safety of drinking water and your fellow council member says, well, the reality is I'm not going to get reelected unless I pave the parking lot of the curling rink. Again, you know, th that's not an unfair, but how do you explain to the fellow who wants to pave the parking lot that this water safety thing is kind of a little higher on the agenda than the parking lot? And perhaps this is where you might be in a position to say, maybe we better talk to our lawyers about this. Did you realize that not only is council, I mean, the municipality might be liable for this, but you as the individual, because you now know of the importance of this issue and you are not making the investment in the critical, legally required thing that we have to do. And perhaps the gentle, it's to Mr. Mayor. I'm not worried about me, Mr. Mayor. I'm worried about you. And again, I know that's a threat, but can we, it's, a, it's not a made up threat. Is this a threat that you can use to inspire 
action by Mr. Mayor to do the right thing. Say, we, we're not dealing with criminals here. We're dealing with hardworking, dedicated public servants. And I think if a dedicated, hardworking public servant understands the importance and the priority that the law places, that they will do the right thing, that they will make that very difficult but necessary culling of the list of 10 things to do, what's the most important one we're going to do? Now, if I can leave you with a final message. I'm a lawyer, and it always is surprising, well, perhaps not surprising to me, that when lawyers talk to an audience like this, industry, municipal, officials. There's always this incredible focus on due diligence. That's the word. That's what people want the lawyers to talk about. That's what the lawyers talk about. But due diligence is the defense. Due diligence is a defense after the bad thing has happened. And it seems to me a little silly. It's like going to a bunch of potential um, murderers and saying, well, let's have a course on self-defense. Let's get our understanding of what the elements of the defense of self-defense are so that we can be prepared. No. I've had a wonderful time prosecuting. I've had a wonderful, wonderful career. But I would, the world would be a better place if there weren't so many violations out there. The world would be a better place if there weren't so in very many environmental infractions. And that rather than focusing on defending yourself after the bad thing happens, maybe the better question, the better focus is to prevent the bad thing from happening in the first place. And as unpleasant as it is to face criminal charges, as unpleasant as it might be to stand in a witness box or in the dock, it compares nothing to the tragedies of the Walkertons of the world. And surely we don't have to learn the lessons through the Walkertons of the world. So if the focus, I think, is better on preventing the offense, ironically, in devoting energy to prevention, you have created due diligence that you have protected yourself, but you've done something far more important. You have protected your family, your friends, and your community. Thank you.